What's up, y'all? It is Dog Talk Tuesdays, and we are live. Uh, Maurice, what's up, man? Thanks for joining in. Uh, who else is in here? Derek Hatfield, what's up, man? Ace Town, what's up, dude? Thanks for joining in. Got Donica Whitaker in the house. Said, tuning in for that wealth the info as always keep it coming what's up thanks for joining in you guys we're gonna go ahead and get started give me a second turn this phone off and what else do we got here uh let me see here hold on let me get this shared into the group and we can go ahead and get it going and see what today's topics are Come on, why is the computer going slow? Let me close all this stuff out. Boom, boom. All right. There we go. And remember, if you are on Facebook, uh, sometimes it shows me your comment, sometimes it doesn't. I will always see your comments though, if you are watching from YouTube. And, and hold on, now I'm typing in YouTube. Giant American, there we go. And bam. All right, let's see here. What are today's topics? I'm gonna try to keep track of what's up girl the uh comments hold on just a second let's see here i keep i know i can keep track of the comments from youtube uh but we'll try to keep track of the rest I'm trying to get over to the group but my facebook is moving slow give me just a second there we go all right so Today's topics are, hold on, come on, do what I tell you, computer. Let's see if I reset it. Ah, there we go. All right, so today's topics. Uh, Breeding game, the bully game, and the social media game. Which one are you playing? Uh, second topic was by Ryan Zimbark. Coefficient of inbreeding and what it means for breeding. What is high or low, et cetera, i.e. my boy is COI of 19%. As a coefficient of inbreeding at 19%. Uh, third topic was by Siler Berry dealing with the law. And last topic I threw up, Dave Wilson made a post uh, today where he showed a dog running and he was saying that the American bully can be athletic, it can be functional and it can be durable. So let's go ahead and, and jump into uh, Dave Wilson's post first. Let me see what we got here in the comments. Bully Brad said, what's good everybody? Eric Maxwell is in the house. We got Rams bait and tackle from San Antonio, Texas. What's up, man? Thanks for joining in. Uh, John Christian's in the house. Dion, what's up, dude? Hey, I saw your uh, – uh, I'm going to hit you back on that. I saw your uh, – sent me a messenger, but I was unable to uh, to go look at what you were telling me to go look at. So I'm going to do that when we're done here uh tj Tac tactical what's up man thanks for joining in hotep is in the house all right we got the montgomery's in the house from canada and who else is in here here brian edwards so the dave wilson post basically he made a post of one of his dogs uh i think he said his son runs with the dog two miles a day and he said that the American bully can be functional, can be, or his words, can be functional, can be athletic, 
and can be durable. Actually, you know what? Let me open up another Facebook and then I can read exactly what he said to you guys. Uh, Dave Wilson, is that him? Yeah, okay. So his exact words were, so he's got the video of the dog running. He says, American Bully can be athletic. It can be functional and can be durable. It's all in the blood. Uh, Nine-month-old male on his daily run. My son does a two-mile run, and his bully loves to follow him on our trail. Mark my words how bully this dog will mature to be. He won't be a classic. Uh, so I'm assuming he's talking about standard. And uh, then he just kind of explains that the video is shaky, blah, blah, blah. Um, then he says he filmed as he can. I tried to film um, but got left behind in the first few seconds. Old bullies don't have the stamina. Now, I wasn't too sure what he meant by when he said old bullies don't have the stamina. Um, I wasn't sure if he was talking about, you know, the older versions, which we know tended to not be as bulldogish in traits as today's uh, preference. Uh, so I'm not sure what he meant by that. When he says, mark my words, I believe this dog will mature to be, he won't be a classic. Um, I'm assuming he's talking about the dog would be a standard. Now, the dog's only nine months old, so it hasn't fully developed. And depending on how it develops, it can lose some of its agility, its athleticism. What did strike me, though, is that I thought was a good thing, is that he did mention the words athletic. He mentioned the words functional. He mentioned the words durable. Athletic, we all know what that means. Functional, we have a good idea of what that means. Um, and to me... Eli, as I've said before, functional should be a thing that is not based off of a breed, but should be based off of the species when you use that word. Uh, and he said it's durable. And again, durable, that means it's a small punishment. And when I say punishment, I'm more talking about uh, being uncomfortable uh, and, and continue pushing itself. So he's speaking on a drill. Even dog. So it's funny that the community uh, is so against, you know, what I've been kind of preaching for about four or five years now with this with this breed. Um, what I did notice, hold on, let me turn this off because I can hear myself echoing. There we go. What I did notice is he was very, how would you say it? Um, I wouldn't say calculated but he intentionally used the word can. So his words were the American bully can be athletic, can be functional and can be durable. Um, it's all in the blood. So I read that what, what I hear is one, that these things that you just state, athleticism, functionality and durability are things that are in the blood of the American bully, which I agree with, but then we start going different directions and when i see the word can be it's almost it's come up to me like he's giving you a choice you know can be type thing uh, so you know you one has to wonder what, what what is his actual preference you know he's highlighting this but what is his actual preference when he uses the word it can be um anything can be something but what is it that it what should it be you know i would love for him to say the american bully should be athletic should be functional and should be durable but unfortunately he doesn't if you look at the abkc written standard uh in the past it stated that the dog was agile and able to move smoothly uh whereas for whatever reasons that has been removed so there was no functionality the expectation so when I first saw this and I saw the words athletic, functional, durable, I'm thinking, okay, he's he's given everybody an expectation. But he throws the monkey wrench into my philosophy of dogs and what the American bully should be because he puts can be. Um, so I don't know what to think of that. You know, you guys let me know what, what it is you you think of that. Um, but I will state it is a step, say it is a step in the right direction because he is speaking on the American bully being in a dog and doing what dogs do. Um, let's see what you guys got to say. Uh, let's see, we got heart and soul bullies.
from the East Coast. What's up, man? Thanks for joining in. Uh, let's see. We got uh, Rob House, uh, H-Town. Uh, let's see. Buffalo is in the house. And uh, Bully Brad Kendall said, did he say can? Because before he used to say should. I think B, if he says can, why like having a non-functional dog should be the normal. Yeah, it's kind of like, what are you, when you throw that word can in there, it's like, you know, it can be if we breed it for that, but it is that's what you, Dave Wilson, one of the founders of the breed, the man that runs ABKC, is that what you're expecting? Because it's not necessarily what we see uh, when we look at the show ring, especially in the show ring winners. Uh, you know, functional, eh, um, durable, I doubt most of them are durable. And uh, athletic, we, we can look at them and tell most of them aren't athletic. Most of the dogs that win are not durable. Um, functional, you know, is kind of up for interpretation. You have to see what it can do. It's function has to do with purpose. And if we're saying it has to, it's not a purpose for this breed, then when we say functional, what are, what are we talking about? So it's kind of a monkey wrench in there when he throws the word can in there. Uh, let's see. I'm in the house. Uh, what's up, Carl? Thanks for joining in. Uh, GJ Yes TV from Albuquerque. What's up, man? Let's see who else we got in here. Uh, CPT Bullies. What's up, man? Thanks for joining in. Uh, let's see. Castro says there a difference between an XL pit bull and an XL American bully. Good question. When I was young and these dogs were first getting going, you had the XL and double XL pit bulls. The XL pit bull was anything that was standard to XL size of what you see today. Um, there really isn't a difference. They are running with XL pit bull for the leaner versions of the xl american bully but you are uh, they typically are bullies your xl pit bulls are typically uh bullies coming from the same they come from the same lineage so xl pit bull is tends to be either people who just didn't want to move away from those terms used in the late 90s um fully vested into the american bully classification or breed uh, it also has to do with some people just like, look, but you also have people who breed American bullies and for the terms pit bull and how popular it is on the internet, when people start Googling, they'll use the word XL pit bull just to let you know, okay, this is a large pit bull type dog. You call them and that's when they'll let you know this is an American bully. Um, so there's a difference with the wordplay, not necessarily a difference with the dogs when it comes to the actual dogs to a difference between the dogs other than the leanness uh let's see we got ace 900 from oklahoma uh dion said misha's athletic see and you know it's like when i look at cardi bull cardi bull she's boned up she's thick she's muscular she's massive um but she's still very powerful, very athletic. So, you know, and then uh, there's a female I'll be picking up next year. Uh, she's already a year old. Uh, she's uh, She'll be more athletic, a lot of heavy, uh, a lot of greyhound, uh, not greyhound, a lot of gray line blood uh, in her. So I prefer a, a happy medium, you know, between the two. Uh, I don't need these dogs for hog catching or anything like that. Um, but at the same time, I want them to have the size and weight. They come across somebody's dog that is aggressive, pit bull, whatever. They they can back it up with their own agility, their power, whatever it is. And plus, it's just a more impressive look. Uh, Jerome said, use can to allow the dogs that don't a gray area to be eased in. Um use can okay use can to allow the dogs that that don't a gray area to be eased in exactly but is he also using can to allow some of those dogs in that gray area to be eased out 
You know what I mean? So it's like it can go both. I just thought it was was uh, interesting that he had worded worded it that way. Busa Bam, what's up, man? Thanks for joining in. Um, so yeah, like I said, I, I thought that was interesting. Somebody from Facebook said, "Good evening, good evening to you too." Uh, Rob said, is it safe to breed a cryptic Merle to another cryptic Merle? I would not because that means they both have the Merle gene. They just aren't showing it. Um, and I don't think enough is known about the Merle gene and the American bully. So until somebody runs with the experiment, um, you know, you can talk about genetics and the alleles and locusts and all these other little terms but um, this is important thing about the most important so until somebody does that and is honest about the results um you know we're never really gonna know uh but i would advise not breeding any type of merle whether it's cryptic merle or shows merle to a you know another merle now there are some people that get into the tail of the gene if it has the long tail or short tail if it's got a short tail you can breed it to a long tail gene and i'm not talking about the tail of the dog i'm talking about the tail of the of the gene but um i personally i don't get involved in all that stuff i i, I strictly deal with the uh merle's not we do have a merle uh we just did a breeding with her so hopefully that took um but i don't we don't ever plan on merle being an actual part of our program i'm actually hoping that off for this breeding that we just did she's a woodland daughter I'm hoping that uh, we get a non-merle bring into our program because I like woodland a lot. But uh, as far as actually bringing merle into our program, we may produce merles for pet homes, but we're not producing merles uh, for our actual program. It's not going to be a, a staple of our program. Um, let's see. I, I put on 100, said, have you ever bred two males of the same litter to the same bitch? and have better results than the male you kept yes uh with with i kept a litter kept a male off of it and this was with uh pit bulls and uh old family red nose norod line and um i kept a male off of that and bred him to a female a uh, buddy of mine kept his brother his his litter mate and uh I like the results that I got from the female. I didn't know a lot about her. I'd only seen her perform and results, they were good. But overall, and this is what was interesting, that litter, a litter of nine, brought to her, that litter was a better, overall litter than the litter from the male that I bred to her first the, the brother that I bred to her first but none of them were as good as those two pups from the male that I bred to her if that makes sense so you know and, and it's just genetic play you know what I mean genetics is random and that's one of the main things we all have to remember about genetics you know um but yeah i have done that before and did get a better overall litter from one pup but did not get outstanding pups from the from the, the uh, outstanding pups like the two that i got when i bred the brother that i actually own so um you can get that you can you're definitely going to get variations uh, and it's just about being able to analyze and look at your your litter uh, Rashad, what's up, dude? Thanks for joining in. Uh, we got Jordan in the house from West Virginia. Uh, Albert Porras is in the house. He said, is there really a difference between band dogs and XL American bullies? There's a huge difference. Um, band dog and pit bull, for some strange reason, are used as insults in the bully community because most people don't know. One, they don't know what a pit bull is. Otherwise, they wouldn't say the dog the the egg massive and boned up and with a lot of bulldog traits they say oh it just looks like a pit bull but, but when you look at a pit bull it doesn't look like a pit bull. it's more like staff 
but it doesn't look like a pit bull. And the drugs are strictly about performance. That's it. The breed has nothing to do with it. The color has nothing to do with it. It's strictly the dog's ability to perform, and you're using that for breeding. That's why um, you have to question a band dog breeder when they have Merle in their program because was that dog actually the best performer that you had to select from, or did you breed to that? dog just because it was merle and then if you have a litter of merle pups you can't and you have you start breeding merle into your program and now all of a sudden you got a great performer here that's merle and you got a great performer here that's merle you can't take your program to the next level of performance because you got your two best dogs are merle so you have to question band dog breeders when they bring merle into their program but the dogs are different there were similarities as far as the history of the two uh in the 90s uh dog fighting was hit real hard here in california and a lot of people started kind of migrating into more human aggressive dogs for protection and guardian work and um band dogs became popular uh people were crossing pitbull with presser canario cane corso neapolitans um you know anything to make have that drive of the pit bull in master and in, in master form and band dogs became extremely popular here in uh cali especially southern cali actually in northern california also the thing about a band dog like i said though is it is strictly bred for performance it's a style of dog that has been bred for thousands of years the name is an old name um band dog how you spelled it, B-A-N-D-O-G-G-E-S, is the same as band dog, B-A-N-D-O-G. Uh, you'll get people who say, oh, well, they're different. No, it's the same thing, just a difference in spelling. Um, doggy is what people used to call, dog is doggy for short. So there are cultures, especially in the past, that would say doggy. They saw your chihuahua, oh, it's a doggy. They saw your Great Dane, it's a doggy. Band comes from they were they were uh they were held back they were leashed they were chained and then at night they were released to guard whatever estates or whatever was going on so a band dog is a dog that's bred for catch work whether it's catching a human or it's catching uh you know boar whatever it may be uh so it's strictly bred for performance the xl american bully though they're similar breeds is bred a whole different direction and that is not bred for performance it's also bred for a specific look band dog is not bred for a specific type of look or style there's no uh written standard for it there's just an expectation uh for it uh so that they are not the same dog and most times people will say they see an xl oh he's big he's just a band dog well they think just mixing a pit bull and a mastiff makes a band dog. That's not true. There has to be a purpose for that dog, uh, whether it's catching humans or it's catching uh, wild animals. And uh, some people are able to accomplish that in the same litters. They, in fact, some people would call Floyd, my Floyd, a band dog because he was pit and boxer. Uh, Three fourths old family red nose, Norad line, one fourth boxer. Um, you, I was able to take certain pups and know that, okay, these pups that are more uh, secluded are going to be better for uh, people who are looking for guardians. And I was also able to take the other pups and say, these pups here will be better for doing catch work because uh, they like to play a lot. They're roughhousing with the pack, with the litter a lot. So, you know, and that's the average band dog breeder, true band dog breeder, I should say, is uh, breeding for one of those two purpose uh, but no I'll go Argentino is one of my favorite breeds uh, I was actually tempted to get into that before we got into bullies uh, but yeah that is that is one of my favorite breeds I love them uh, Castro said do you carry a brake stick when you walk your dogs in the woods or park uh in the woods no i do brake sticks are illegal here in california um, so what i would advise people especially those of bull bred dogs is if it's legal in your city county state i would advise you to carry it just so more for the fact of your dog getting into it with a another dog um so that you can easily break dog fight up 
Uh, as far as in the woods where I'm worried about a wild animal, no, I'm not going to use a brake stick and I'm, and my dog's fighting a wild animal. Um, you know, he's going to have to handle his business. He or she's going to have to handle their business on their own. I'm not, my dog gets a hold of a raccoon. I'm not getting in there with a brake stick, you know, because the thing is with a wild animal, you can use that brake stick to get it off of it. And then all of a sudden that wild animal snaps and takes advantage or you get too close. The next thing you know, you're bit by that wild animal. I'm not willing to get bit by any wild animals for my dog. So when they've gotten into it with bobcats, coyotes, raccoons, they're on their own. I might throw a kick in if I had to. And if it wasn't something we were hunting. But other than that, I'm not getting in there with a brick stick in it. Wild animal. Catch that. Um, that is a fact because Floyd's one of those. He's not letting go even when it's dead. So it's easier just to, you know, use a brake stick. Um, but no, when I'm walking in the woods, as far as for wildlife, I, I don't use a brake stick. Uh, Jordan said, so what's the difference in standards for UKC and ABKC? And is there any other registry you use? Right now we use ABKC and UKC. Um, one that is kind of coming up and getting more popular is BRC. So we're kind of thinking about use, utilizing them. Uh, probably not. We should be having a litter. Well, we just did a breeding. Uh, we'll be doing another breeding. I think it'll be next month and another breeding shortly after that. And then after this phase passes, we'll probably start registering dogs with BRC, but we will always use UKC. And the difference KC is the biggest American bully registry. Um, they are the go-to. Uh, they operate as a registry and a kennel and a breed club uh, because they're also giving direction in the breed. You know, most kennels like UKC, they just sit back and the breeders do what they do. Um, so let's start with the ABKC. ABKC, I think, started registering these dogs in 2004. Started in 2004, bullies based on the American bully. Now they take in other breeds also. Um, the UKC uh, was kind of hijacked into the American bully because they had to kind of, people were registering their dogs with the U. The breed started off with people registering their American bullies with the UKC as a pit bull. UKC has no way of knowing what you're sending paperwork in on, so they just register it, help them keep track of their paperwork. The ABKC came along, so then people started registering to the ABKC, and the ABKC also gives us some direction and guidance through uh, Dave Wilson as far as what direction we're supposed to be headed and what direction we're supposed to go with uh, this breed and their expectations of it. The UKC, I would suggest everybody register with them due to the fact they are the oldest registry. They're guaranteed. I don't think ABKC is ever going anywhere. I know the UKC is never going to go anywhere. So I would say utilize both registries. As far as this for a more extreme uh, dog, uh, they want the dog to be human friendly, animal friendly. And that's about it. Uh, they also are looking for since tends to have a preference of a shorter legged dog. UKC is a little more classic style. Now they say 20 to, uh, I think they say 17 to 20. They don't, UKC does not break into classes. So you just register your American bully. They prefer the dog to be 17 to 20 inches, but you've got grand champions with the UKC like Prince Charmer who is, I want to say Heather said he's about 24 inches. So they take them all from pockets to XLs, but they don't call them pocket or XL. They are just American bully. From what I understand, UKC will not get involved in breaking them into classes or getting more into the breed standard until we have an actual breed club. Uh, there is a lady that is kind of in, I don't know that she's necessarily in charge, charge of it but she's spearheading that so i do want to uh get her on for an interview and she seems like she's cool with it so i just got to hit her up again but um the U ukc does does have a does not mention anything about says the dog should be human friendly 
if I'm not mistaken, they don't say anything about whether the, the American bully is uh, dog friendly or not. Uh, that seems to not be their concern. They also have an expectation that the American bully um, is uh, able to perform and compete in competition. So when you look at the UKC dog, American bully, it tends to be a leaner dog, a little more leg on it. Um, they, because of it being a bull bred breed, they tend to uh ukc does have an equity with the american bully whereas the abkc is just strictly focused on on looks uh and i would say that's the main two uh the main differences between the two but definitely utilize both of them the other thing is you get to some apartment complexes and they say no you can't bring that pit bull in here and you pull out your abkc paperwork and say no this is an american bully most that apartment comes has never heard just about everybody's heard of UKC. So I would say register with both. Um, John Christian said, have you ever did embark pairing with any of your dogs in your yard? If so, why did you, if not, how come you didn't, I've never done embark, uh, pairing. Uh, I don't really get, and we're going to be talking about that when we get into, uh, the COI coefficient of inbreeding. Um, but I don't really, get you into that kind of stuff we are going to be starting to health test our dogs uh and that'll be about the you know most we do as far as you know the whole uh genetic scheme of things uh, now with this merle breeding we are going to be testing the non-merle pups so that we know which one more of them carry the merle gene and which of them don't if we get a good pup with prospect that does not carry the merle gene we will bring that into our breeding program due to the fact we do like the female that we're using. And uh, we also like her father Woodland a lot. So, um, but no, I've never, I've never used Embark or any of that stuff. Uh, how do I know if my female is being protective or if it's just fear aggression? Uh, fear, one, you don't want to get fear confused with defensive um you know if it's fear typically you're gonna see that tail lower a little bit uh she will give a warning same thing with protection you'll get a warning but the tail won't lower the dog is still maintains his confidence um if she's being protective she will typically advance forward uh if a dog is fearful it will typically uh, stay right by you or even back up. Um, so I would look at it more protection is something that advances forward. Fear is something that stands its ground or backs up. Um, if a dog is protective, it's natural instinct is going to be for it to step forward. You and whatever it sees as a threat. Um, you kind of know fear when you have a dog that is constantly uh, being showing aggressive to showing aggression towards humans that aren't even thinking about it. You know, now you can also have a dog that is just highly human aggressive was accidentally bred that way or bred that, that way intentionally. Uh, it's just got a high civil drive. Uh, those dogs are going to be aggressive towards people who aren't thinking about them. So you kind I would have to kind of see it, but as far as what you're stating and just to give you an idea, Always look at fear, either stands its ground or it backs up. Uh, protection will all, especially if I know I've got a leash on, because I know you don't want me running at whatever this thing is. Otherwise, you wouldn't be holding my leash, but I'm still going to stretch that leash out as far as I can. That typically is protection. Um, the other thing is, is whatever the dog's looking at doing anything that should be perceived as, as a threat. So that's something I would have to actually see your dog in the moment or have a little more detail. Uh, ever have a pup that don't like to exit cage when it's open, but he's confident and doesn't mind going outside to pee when grabbed by scruff and walked outside. Um, some dogs are weird with threshold. So going from, how would you say, going from one, area to the next um i try to put myself in that shoes in their shoes so i don't know if it's just kind of a height thing uh what that is but kind of that way i had 
a uh, beagle that when hunting, if there was a bunch of trees, perfectly fine. But if there was two trees, he would always go around unless he smelled the scent going through it. But he would always go around two trees. Some dogs, um, you can have your couch sitting. There's a gap between your couch and the wall for whatever reasons they won't go uh in that gap my aunt does uh, she's got this lamp and then a couch and he won't walk between there he stops and will go all the way around the couch to get where he could have just stepped between so some dogs have a, a weird thing with thresholds what i would say is get him to go through it as many times as you possibly can to get him over it uh whether you're using treats uh just build his confidence going through it so that he understands nothing is about to uh to collapse on uh let's see slayer the pit what's up man mr daryl always with that fire knowledge thanks for everything you do thanks for joining in bro i appreciate that uh dom what's up man thanks for joining in uh let's see yes thank you casper i always forget about that make sure you guys like the video uh click like whether you're on Facebook or uh, YouTube, definitely make sure to click click like on it. Uh, let's see who else we got in here. Would breeding granddaughter to granddaughter to grandfather or grandson to grandmother be considered a line breeding or an inbreeding? I consider it a line breeding. I consider an inbreeding uh, anything that is like within a house, like within your average household. So brother to sister, um, son to mom, daughter father. I look at that as inbreeding. Breeding granddaughter to grandfather is a close line breeding, what I would call it. Um, and what is your question? Would breeding granddaughter to grandson mother be considered line breeding? So I would consider it line breeding. Some people consider it inbreeding. Uh, um, but in my opinion, it is a line breeding. Uh, let's see. Hotep said, thank you for breaking down the difference. Tired of people calling my dogs band dogs as an insult. Yeah. To call a dog a band dog as an insult is crazy because it's one of the it was between dogos and band dogs before we decided to commit to bullies um but that's one of the greatest breeds there are when they're bred correctly for performance so um i wouldn't most people that say that they don't know what a band dog is and so i wouldn't uh i i would just laugh at them uh let's see eric says so if whopper was a catch or protection slash guardian dog he would have been considered a band dog i'm uh, assuming you're talking about uh want to be a whopper um uh, but yeah but now at the same time let's say you take the bully but you breed it for, for catch work or protection it's still an american bully due to his blood and it's an official breed the band dog is not an actual breed you are constantly breeding to the next best thing um there are a few people h lee robinson one of them where they've gotten to where they want to get with their band dogs so now they are starting to only breed within their yard they're not bringing in any new breeds um and so they're formulating you know their own breed based off of their their history uh and breeding band dogs so um but yeah so to breed a but on the flip side of that dog is bred for some would say a <coughs> excuse me some would say a wattweiler used for band dog work is a band dog or used for work as a band dog or a presser or whatever um so can a purebred be a band dog yeah but that's because band dog is a title given to a dog by its peers after it has proven itself i would say the easiest way to deal with it is a as a rottweiler a press as a pack the word band dog that means this dog is bred strictly for performance regardless of the breeds used regardless of the color it's strictly about performance so if this pit bull needs size i'm going to breed it to a massive if the massive needs a little more drive i'm going to breed it to a pit bull and that's how band dogs should be looked at. uh what's up mr j thanks for joining in let's see who else what makes a break stick illegal isn't it to break dogs up from fight yeah here in california we are extremely liberal and uh extremely influenced by PETA. so there are a lot of things uh considered uh, associated with dog fighting and the break stick is one of them so if they catch you with a break stick 
it is looked at automatically like you are a dog fighter or something. Now I know at one one point even treadmills were illegal, but I heard recently not in trouble. As long as you haven't been accused of dog fighting, then the treadmill is fine. Um, so that's the thing about the brake stick. So you do need to make sure that it is legal in your area to have it because some people, some of us live in areas where if you have a brake stick, you're automatically assumed to be a dog fighter. Uh, Donna said, does anyone else keep freezing in and out? I saw your merch on your FB page. Do you ship to the UK? I think we do. I can check with my cousin to make sure. Um, so I can find that out for you. And uh, we can also put post up more to be seen because I don't think we posted it since that one posting. And uh, should be you guys should be going. It shouldn't be freezing now because I did notice it for a second. If it's a band dog, you have to prove it through performance exactly. And that performance is going to be either catching, typically hogs, or through protection. Uh, brace sticks are considered tools in dog fighting, and that alone is what makes them illegal in some states. Exactly uh where are they illegal that i do not know so you, you need to look that up because it can be legal in your state but not in your county so that's something that you would need to look up um tent spike would be perfect uh, uh and i know exactly the ones you're talking about but yeah tent spike would be good just make sure that it's a durable plastic not metal or anything where you mess up your dog's teeth I'm in Illinois, I'd use a brace stick when other people's dogs run up on my dogs. There you go. Uh, Tom uh, the Montgomery said, I'm in the, I'm all the only one that the live is a little glitchy. Okay. It should, looks like everything's going, but you know what, on my computer it's kind of freezing. So I'm not too sure what that's about. Should I go to the vet for my pregnant female, even if I'm trying to do natural birth? Both male and female were born naturally. If they were both born naturally and both of them are similar in size, the next thing that you would ask yourself is how many pups are in the litter? If you got eight or more pups, chances are she can get away with having a natural birth because the pups are going to come out smaller. They'll still grow to whatever size they're going to be. But while they're in their stomach, they tend to be smaller. Do you have eight or less pups? Um, it's a gamble with this breed, so it depends on the 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 uh, extremes of your dog. Large heads, thick shoulders, cause issues, and it looks like it might have just froze up again. Let's see here. So uh, that's what I would. Um, that's what you got to think about. A large, if both dogs were born naturally, and they're similar in size to them to each other and their parents then chances are you'll be perfectly fine, especially if you've got a litter of eight or more pups. You, you got less than eight pups, then it's kind of up to you. Find out how large her litter was that she was in and still be ready to get that uh, C-section done just in case there is an emergency. All right, everything's glitchy at times. Uh, let's see. Hopefully it fixes itself. Would you recommend to get dual registered through UKC and ABKC? Yes, I would. Uh, Dom, yes, you should just make sure that you can give natural birth, but get a second opinion and keep. Yeah, the other thing is some vets, not all, but some vets will um, measure the, look at the size of the pups compared to uh, her birth canal. And as long as they see that the pups, and I think they usually do it right around 50, 45 to 50 days, if they see that the pups look like they'll fit through that birth canal fine, then they'll let you know, okay, go ahead. So ask, your, ask talk to your vet and see what they think is best based off the x-rays. Uh, Black Bottom Bullies, what's up, man? Thanks for joining in. Uh, UKC is working on updating the standard from what I heard. I've heard the same thing, but I heard that until we have a breed club with the a national breed club with the UKC, and for whatever reasons, they're having a hard time getting uh, getting people uh, to be a part of that. How many dogs should you have before calling yourself a kennel? Good question. Um, yeah, I don't know. I never considered myself a kennel. Uh, when I had, you know, one to two dogs, I would say hey, when you're housing, I would say when you're in your actual home and, uh, you know, they're either 
confined in the garage and, and uh, you know, five by five, 10 by five, whatever uh, cages. That's when I look at it as a kennel. You know what I mean? Because then I say, oh, you got a kennel set up. So then I would say, therefore, you're a kennel. So um, if you've got a kennel set up due to the dogs that you have or are using, that's when I would say you're a kennel. But if you got two dogs living in the home that you breed, I don't consider that, you know, a kennel. Um, so that I would say if you've got a kennel set up, then you're a kennel. That you're a kennel set up that you're using. I thought UKC started bullies in 2013 and ABKC in 2004. Am I wrong? uh abkc was 2004 ukc i'm not sure if it was 2013 or 2014 but um i i want to say that that's about right um but the dogs were first registered with ukc they were just registered as pit bulls basically we were hanging papers on them as pit bulls eric said with fear the dog will usually look at you with a side eye slightly lowered head stare uh, where a protective dog is going to let you know he's watching you, the person. I would agree with that. I would definitely agree with that. Um, this guy keeps popping up. I got to go through here and block who, whatever that is. Um, You've been popping up for like two weeks now. KJ Johnson said, tips on teaching a puppy to stack. Uh, one, I would say get two by fours. Uh, you can see I actually make uh, stacking stands now. Uh, look on Facebook. You'll see. You could probably type it in. Might be able to Google it. Um, and you can actually kind of move them back and forth. I would say if it's a pup, you should be able to get a decent sized brick or two by fours. Um, what you want to remember is that the front leg should be going straight up. The back leg should be angled. You know how a dog's legs are angled. And you want the toes, if you took a line and drew it straight down the butt. So let's say this is the line. The butt of the dog is here. You want the toes to be here, right? At the, the tip of the toes should be at the line that will go straight down from, from the butt of the dog. And really, a lot of times, a lot of times when you see people have, if here's the butt and this is the line going down, and then here's the toes, they start having the toes back here further and further back and a lot of times that's to hide a high rear um but that's how you want to look how you want to uh look at that uh and when it comes to stacking the dog what age should ear cropping be done i want to say here in college is 14 weeks or four months um once the dogs get over that uh there's some uh that will still do it that's some Something you got to look at in your state, uh, but I would say you want to do it as early as possible uh, between that age of four and six months so that the ear does have some time to, well, I say between three and six months so that the ear has some time to develop. Uh, if the ear is still too floppy, the vet, you know, uh, may, may end up cutting it incorrectly. Uh, so you want the ear to be somewhat, the cartilage in the ear to be somewhat there uh, for them to uh, cut it. Let's see. Tuning in from Phoenix, I would like to learn more about weight pull. Is there weight divisions for the dog size? Yes, there is. Uh, she's classic but strong. How would I start training her? I would say the most the thing about weight pull, one, get a proper harness so that she's pulling correctly and doesn't injure herself. The other thing I would say when it comes to weight pull is um, start her off with just the, the harness itself and the chain dragon. Get her used to that sound the feel of it uh then you can go ahead and add some cans or milk cartons to it you know so they get here a little bit more sound uh and then you know finally you start adding uh weight to it and always start light start light let her maintain that for about a week then you can start increasing the weight once a week uh from there and just take it gradual so that you don't injure the dog i don't know how old you know your dog is but take it very gradual and work your way up and then you need to get an idea of what gets the dog going harder because when you're in competition you want to you want to you want to be able to trigger your dog to go as hard as possible so is it a treat is it a favorite toy is it just you clapping your hands and yelling you want to know all that but definitely with weight pull get your dog used to the sounds get your dog used to excitement uh, so that it doesn't get intimidated and stays focused on the task at hand. 
but start off with lightweight first. And as far as exercises, you want to run long walks, uh, sprinting, playing fetch. Uh, and then, of course, you know, dragging weight for practice uh, is always going to be good. Uh, bully bread, Ken, my female is born naturally or mom always. I'm putting her to my standard male. Same height, but a lot more bone. I think she will be straight, but I'm having at least 2K. Not sure what you mean by that. But um, so you're bringing a classic. Her mom always does. My female is born. I'm putting her to my. Okay, so you got a classic female going to a standard male. So depending on how extreme he is, what's well, making him a standard. You just want to be aware, you know, he's going to, those pups are going to have larger head, thicker shoulders, wider shoulders. Um, so I would say, again, I would still, you know, utilize your vet, your x-ray done to confirm pregnancy and all that. Just confirm pregnancy around 40, 45 days, 50 days, have the vet look at the birth canal and uh, see if that's something that they might, they might have to do an ultrasound instead of an x-ray but to see if that's something that uh the vet thinks it's a go ahead to go ahead to try uh on deck just in case i need to take her to her into the vet exactly uh they're going to have weight pool contests at a bully show here in arizona in march yeah so if you're getting ready for it again i don't know how old she is but if that's something that you're interested in uh weight pool i think is great for dogs the nails are clipped you want them uh, you don't want anything cracking uh so make sure the nails are clipped and then uh take your time getting her prepared for it if it's in march we're already at december uh that should be enough time just get into it for the fun for right now you know what i mean uh just to have her and get used to it the surroundings show up warmer uh just kind of warm her up warm her up to it and uh, let's see, Dom said, can I still put apple cider in my pregnant female's water? When my females are pregnant, I avoid, it's only what, 60 days, 63 days. So I don't, I just give them fresh water. Don't worry about apple cider vinegar uh, when she's pregnant. Also deworming after pregnancy, mosquito on Guam are crazy. Do the deworming. Um, Yes, after pregnancy. Go ahead. I wouldn't do it during the pregnancy. Do it after the pregnancy, especially if you guys got mosquitoes like that. Um, once the pups hit, uh, you get get them uh, their shot. Uh, you start deworming them. But um, yeah, do the deworming as soon. If you got issues with mosquitoes, do the deworming immediately after uh, after pregnancy. Um, wait a minute. Hold on. Okay. She's still whelping. Um, I personally don't like I personally don't like interfering with anything. Some people say that there are certain dewormers you can use. So when she finishes whelping, am I freezing? When she finishes whelping, then go ahead and do the deworming. And we're only looking at two months of pregnancy, approximately two months of pregnancy, and then you're doing you know another two months. Well, one month, you know, because you'll be taking them off of her at about what? At about four weeks, four to five weeks. So that's not a long time. So I would say hold off on anything. That's just my advice. Uh, I like everything to be natural when uh, once I confirm my female's pregnant. So, yeah, as far as deworming, I would just hold off until she's actually uh, pups. Uh, Black Bottom Bully said, would you prefer dogs on gravel or on wooden platforms for an outside setup? I heard cement is bad for the limbs. Um, uh, cement didn't used to be bad for dogs' limbs. Uh, I would say we are going to be moving next year. Uh, and the kennel, we will probably, I've been debating on whether we want to put wood down or whether we want to cement. We've got a, a old barn. And uh, so I've been trying to figure out what I want to do with that. Um, if the wood is treated where you can easily clean it off, then I would run with the with the wood. Uh, but cement is not bad. Uh, you just want to make sure that you are getting the dogs off of and out of the kennels as much as possible, regardless of what it is. So I don't have a problem with cement kennels as far as it being bad for limbs. The dog typically in its kennel 
is uh, the dog typically in his kennel is going to walk, uh, may do a little jumping, not much, but uh, you know, uh, I don't have a problem with cement uh, in kennels. Uh, let's see, Grow Logic said, can you give me some advice on a pup with retained puppy teeth, uh, specifically the two top things all the other teeth fell out except that so he still got his puppy teeth at six months old two of his puppy teeth at six months old um and that i've never heard of so i can't really speak on it i don't think i'd worry too much about it for another two months uh once you hit about eight months you might want to talk to the vet um I would even possibly because it's six months and the other teeth have already come in uh, uh I, you might want it to and especially if it's just one pup uh you might want to take that pup to a vet because you also don't want teeth coming in behind those teeth and they come in crooked so i would say go to your vet have your vet look at it and uh see if, and feel in there see if there's other teeth coming in and they just happen to be behind those teeth because you don't want them those teeth that should have been gone causing those teeth to grow uh to grow incorrectly so i would say have your vet look at it um sister nine point oh online i don't know wait till i get uh, off here i'm gonna be deleting you guys in these little weird uh whatever you're posting it's probably some kind of porn stuff so don't any of y'all click on it um rashad davis said they have a whole weight pull facility out in arizona check with the local breeder slash pullers they have weight pull events there all the time i believe it was called the pit bull store there you go uh dom said at black bottom bullies i heard cement bad to put uh but i put a rubber mat on the cement where they sleep there you, yeah you don't want them sleeping on the cement that is you know dogs especially young dogs do a lot of growing and growth when they're young so make sure they've got something padded. Um, now they've got those new ones that's the new dog beds that kind of sit up off the ground. Uh, um, you don't want them sleeping on cement, but getting off of their bed and then onto cement, uh, that's not a problem. But yeah, you, you don't want them having to sleep on the cement. Uh, what's up, Naheem? Thanks for joining in. Uh, let's see who we got here. What's up, Jeremiah? Thanks for joining in. Uh, Eric says, silly question, but what do you think breeders with Colby and Bord, Bord, ah, Bord, Boudreaux would think of today's breeding practices? I think they would laugh at it. Um, we've become heavy into technology. Uh, there's no ability expectations. Uh, we, we've now, we have lowered our expectations. I think they would be cracking up or either cry. Uh, we have lowered a lot of the expectations that we have for dogs, uh, especially in the, the bully community. Um, same thing with the ham staff community. Uh, let's see, for sure. Thanks for tuning in, man. All right, so next topic. We just spoke on Dave Wilson. Uh, Somebody, I think it's pronounced Siler Berry, uh, post to dealing with the loss of dogs. I don't have an advice for that. Um, how you deal with the loss of dogs is based on how many dogs you've lost before. I can tell you one thing though, it doesn't get any easier with time. Every dog is gonna have a, 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 a special, if you are breeding dogs correctly and owning dogs correctly, every dog is gonna have a, uh, it's gonna have a special place with you, uh, regardless of how many other that you know you have because you spend time about some herds and then when they get old and they stop doing those things you miss it you know what i mean and then there's other dogs you're like this dog was perfect it never did anything wrong and you missed that so it never gets easier having to put a dog down um having to get rid of a dog uh, there's no advice i have for that it depends on you as an individual and it also depends on um you know your experiences but and how long you how many times you've dealt with it but i can tell you right now it doesn't get any easier um i have always been since a kid i have always been the one uh that for whatever reasons it always fell on me to take dogs and be put down um 
So it's something now, you know, now that I've got my own family, wife, kids, uh, it's just that thing. Um, everybody in the house knows that I, I go by myself. I take the dog with me by myself. And, um, you know, we have that last little bit of bonding period. Um, I would say when it comes to losing a dog, there, there's no advice that anyone can give. Everybody deals with death and, you know, in their own way. And, uh, you know, like I said, I don't care if you've had a hundred dogs, it, it doesn't get any easier. Um, the process going through the motion gets easier. The emotional aspect though, doesn't get any easier. Uh, El Pordido, what's up, man? Thanks for joining in. Now, what was the next topic was explain Ryan Sterling put explain embark COI coefficient of inbreeding and what it means for breeding what is high or low etc i.e my boy is coi is 19 percent okay so the coefficient of inbreeding what happened is to get breeds we had to begin taking other breeds and then you breed those breeds together and you start line breeding and inbreeding for about five to ten generations depending on how good of a breeder you are and then you come up with a breed that has its own look and its own temperament and its own ability as the breeds that were used to create it. Then to maintain consistency in that breed, it is bred to other dogs of the same breed. And what we started noticing is through uh, inbreeding and line breeding, um, you start to lose health, uh, you start to lose cognition, you start to lose uh, ability, the immune system tends to get weaker. And so breeders try to come up with a formula uh, to figure out what they could do to uh, prevent, um, you know, too much inbreeding or a dog being in the pedigree too, too, too often. And uh, that's where the coefficient of inbreeding came in. And I think the formula is like F, which is your actual percentage equals, uh, one half times in one plus in two in one in and in two are the amount of generations between um the mother and father that go similar dog in there all that shit is confusing and it's based off you know uh uh heterozygous uh genes and uh alleles and homozygous genes and all that stuff what i would say when it comes to the coefficient of inbreeding is the average vet scientist says that dogs should be around five percent to maintain health uh, when you start getting over ten percent you are uh looking at bringing in unhealthy traits the problem with that, that theory is that the average breed is already over 10%. Um, and then you figure if you breed brother to sister, so if you breed siblings, you're automatically at 25%. Uh, so in, most inbreedings are going to put you at right around 25%. I, I think daughter to father is slightly less. Uh, than the 25%, but 25% is where they say that now you're going to cause uh, some type of deterioration in the dog's uh, genetics through its health, its uh, ability, its cognition. But then at the same time, we know you breed dogs for performance, you can get away with uh, more inbreeding than if you were breeding dog or line breeding than if you were breeding dogs for looks. So when it comes to the coefficient of inbreeding, I, it's one of those things when people learn about it, they realize it's kind of hard to understand. Then all of a sudden they figure it out and they put a couple of their pedigrees in there to figure out the formula. And then they think they've got, got it down and then it becomes this end all be all to all their breedings. That's a mistake when it comes to dogs for two reasons. One, this is a performance this is a purpose-driven companion so the two key words in there are purpose 
and a companion. And when you breathe for those two key words, um, a lot of these formulas and scientific thoughts go out the window. Now, when you start breeding for looks, that's when these things, health testing and coefficient of inbreeding becomes more of a factor. When we got into American bullies due to the traits that we saw that were not just breed flaws, but species flaws, we made sure that we were taking dogs that were mostly scatterbred and then making sure that we purchased dogs that were unrelated to other dogs that we purchased so that we could do what we wanted to do without worrying about too much inbreeding or this dog being 10 times Godzilla and then this dog is five times Godzilla and next thing you know you're dealing with issues that you can't breed out. But like I always say, regardless of the thing about dogs is the litter as a breeder is the litter that's in front of you. The two dogs that are in front of you mother mother and father and then the litter that's in front of you you want to make your judgments on things based off of that um you there's a science and a common sense there's a common sense to breeding that causes you to not have to worry about the sciences of breeding and the formulas and all these things that people come up with that hardly breed so what i would suggest in this breed is don't get caught up in the names uh, one of the main reasons um you know they'll say well in the show ring the coefficient of inbreeding is so high that that's why you've got all these diseases uh plaguing the show dogs uh show breed version the show dog version of breeds yeah but if you throw out the notion of inbreeding and just say, okay, but how did we get there? How do we get to this, this high coefficient percentage? The truth is because everybody's breeding to the same dogs, the same circle of people breeding to the same circle of dogs. Uh, if you were to breed for dock diving and all dock diving breeders were stick just one little circle, you're going to run into the same problem. Um, it just won't be as bad as in the show ring because because the show ring is based on looks, dock diving is based on a performance. So that's why I always tell people, play fetch with your dogs. Based off the way those dogs fetch the ball. You know what I mean? Breed based off performance. The dogs that go after it the hardest, those are going to be the ones you want to breed. Let's say they have a little too much prey drive um, that causes them to, get, to be uh, aggressive towards other animals. And that's not what you want then figure out those dogs that still chase the ball hard but get along with other dogs because now the ball becomes a purpose thing rather than a prey thing so now you're breeding for purpose drive so that's what i advise to um all people is figure out an ability and a performance for your dogs and then breed based off of that along with fixing flaws don't get caught up in the hype of popular dogs dogs that are 10 times this 50 times that um that seems to be wearing off a little bit in the american bully community where people are judging the dog that's in front of them regardless of um uh, you know who's 10 times what in their pedigree so i would say when it comes to the coefficient of inbreeding it, um what does it mean for breeding uh it's just a tool you know it's just a tool that you can use embark will if i'm not mistaken will do it for you um but it's just a tool that you can use to prevent yourself uh, and having issues. But chances are of you picking another dog um, that is so closely related to your dog that it's going to be a, that it's going to cause issues are slim because you would typically know that that about that dog. Um, so I think we still have time. Our stud books are still open. Uh, I don't consider coefficient of inbreeding a big deal or something that needs to be learned. Judge, uh, but it needs to, you need to understand the concept and the importance of it or why they feel it's important. It's kind of like um, if you ever go to a business or a marketing seminar, you get there, it's free. You get there, they talk about all these facts, you're taking notes on all these theories and thoughts that they have and concepts that they have. And then at the end of the seminar, the a free seminar they tell you okay we're going to be doing another seminar but it costs 200 bucks or buy this book and it costs 200 bucks blah 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 if you got decent common sense you can go to enough free seminars to where you never have to pay to go to any of their stuff 
and you never have to buy their book or anything like that because you'll get enough from it that you can kind of put one and two together yourself. That's how dog breeding is. To take information from everywhere, most of the resource. But it still all comes down to the two dogs in front of you that they're bre that you're breeding and the litter, you know, and the litter that those dogs came from and the litter that they're going to produce that's in front of you. That's what this is all about. You start to notice out of five pups or ten pups, one or two of them has some little issues you, you would say tend to come from inbreeding or line breeding or dogs being too close in relation, which is typically going to be thicker bone, uh, larger heads funny shaped head, eye separation, bowed legs, things like that. Um, that's when you know, you, okay, I need to back off of that. And I need to outcross. But if you take the formula of I'm going to take unrelated dogs, I'm going to get four to five unrelated dogs or breed out to four or five unrelated dogs. And then I'm going to create my yard. And then off of my yard, I'm going to start line breeding. And I'm going to use the lion breeding to fix the little imperfections that I see need to be fixed. And then once those things are fixed, I'm going to do an inbreeding. And then once I do that inbreeding to lock it in, now I've got a temperament that I like. I've got a look that I like. I've got an ability that I like. You've got all three that you like. Then you go ahead, you do an inbreeding and lock it in. Safest inbreeding to do is father to daughter. Um, a close lion breeding that is that works great is grandfather to granddaughter. But when you have the perfect male and he creates the perfect female, you do that inbreeding. And then from there, you outcross. You want to go to a blood that is totally unrelated to yours or go to a distant, very distant line breeding and uh, make sure that it has those traits that you are looking for, especially if you do an outcross. You don't want to outcross to something that's not as good as what you've perfected through these generations of breeding. And as long as you work it that way, you'll more than likely never need to worry about plugging in the formula of, of coefficient of breeding. Uh, as far as 19%, some would consider that high. But the average breed is going to damn near put you there off jump by the time. So, you know, that's the thing is you have a coefficient of inbreeding for your dog, but then you've also got a coefficient of inbreeding for the breed and the breed is already typically higher. Every breed is typically higher than what they say it should be. So, you know, and that's when you start seeing breeds out cross to other breeds and then being bred back in to their own breed, like the Dalmatian did, the King Corso did by being bred to the box of King Corso lines. Um, so it's one of those things that's fun to learn. But once you've learned it, it's just a tool. Um, you can definitely utilize it, but what's still going to be most important is the dogs in front of you and the litter in front of you. Uh, so I will it that way. Let's go ahead and check the comments. Uh, let's see. Eric said agree. Uh, WR, what's up, brother? Thanks for joining in. John Smith said for us. With nine to five job that has a puppy, should I should I cart him or leave him in the bathroom area with more room? Also, should I leave him with water and food or feed him before I leave for work? Not sure how old your puppy is. What I would advise is getting up earlier for a walk, feed him, get him water, um, let him have time to play. And then bam, put them in a crate. I think crate training is one of the biggest, most understood great tools that there is. Uh, put them in his crate. Make sure the crate has enough room for him to walk around, play. Uh, you don't need to leave toys in there. Um, you know, even the bed, you could put him on something that's soft in the crate so that the crate sits on. Usually the crates have a plastic bottom. Put a couple blankets down so he can sit on there. If you got a pup that, you know, is kind of has enough space in the crate, and then you can put a bed in there. Um, what I always do is get toys that will hang. So he kind of has to raise up. I take like if they've got a chew toy that they like. Um, that way it doesn't get in their urine or their poop if they are still in that phase of pooping and urinating in the kennel. Um, but tie it to the top so that the pup can raise up and he can still play with it as he wants. Uh, and just and that way it just hangs down. Um, 
And then from there, yeah, you know, he's going to learn, you know, to not poop in his crate and to hold it. And I would do that till he's about a year old uh, before I would give him run of the house or anything like that, especially when I'm gone. Um, you know, maybe even a little older. But, yeah, crate train the dog and get the dog used to the crate by when you're not paying attention to it, put it in the crate. Not a punishment. This is just where you are. As far as leaving food and water in there, I wouldn't. I would just feed it before you leave. First thing, as soon as you wake up, feed the dog, let it out, take it for a quick walk, get ready. Put the dog back in its crate, get ready for work. You go to work, you come home. First thing you need to do is let the dog out to use the bathroom. Uh, change your clothes from work, exercise the dog, do all that good stuff. Uh, give the dog about an hour to chill. Then go ahead, give the dog its food, take it back, back out again, and then it goes back in the crate. When you're sitting at home and you're just chilling, you don't plan, you're not playing with the dog, you're not uh, watching the dog, uh, put it in its crate so it can get used to being there and understand that me being in here is not a bad thing. Uh, just make sure that it is large enough so that the dog has accidents. It can have accidents away from where it actually wants to lay down and it, there's no urine running to where uh, the pup is. How many bullies you have in your yard? If you're okay answering that, how many males to females? I only have one female here. Uh, next year, I will be taking on her plus four others. Uh, my kennel partner has five where he's, no, four where he's at. Uh, two males there and two males, no, three males, I'm sorry, so five, three males, two females. Um, the, they are kept separate based off of when they're going into heat, when they're, they're all fine together. Once a female starts going to heat, you know, he knows that month is coming and that's when he starts separating them um, and go from there. But a lot of that, as far as how dogs get along, males, females you got to judge that based off the dogs that you, you want to do a lot of socialization a lot of playing um and bonding with those dogs because them bonding with you is also helps them bond with each other um but yeah so next year i will be swamped uh with dogs uh eric said you even missed the assholes i had on my nerves but still miss him to this day i got an asshole in the house right now that's 15 years old um, El Perdido said, if a person don't have the money for a show quality dog, is there breeders who will help out a person who is serious of starting out with one dog? Um, I think there are. So, and this is a breed that when we say show quality, you kind of have to ask yourself, you know, because you got show dogs that still have high rears, weak pasterns, uh, lack of angulation, dips in their back. You know, that's, this is just a breed where they haven't been too picky on the breed. As as far as specific breeders, I only one I can speak of that I know for certain, I know Ray Burkett has a grand champion, and he stated in a lie that he sells his dogs right around 5,000. Um, you know, but there's nothing wrong with breeding and creating your own show dog. You know what I mean? Um, so just pick the right dogs. It will be, if you're getting into this, I would say focus on just picking the right dogs. Um, you know, the least amount of flaws, uh, with the least amount of flaws as possible. But as far as breeders who, you know, specifically sell show dogs for lower amounts, I don't know of any, they don't really speak on it. So just, uh, you know, get into the groups, um, you know, start asking breeders questions when you see, you know, they're in the show ring, hit them up, find out how much their litters are. And then kind of go from there because they might tell you ten thousand, but then you see another dog. Okay, well this dog is only three thousand, but if I bred it to, I got your text. But if I bred it to this dog, it's only two thousand. They both have decent confirmation. I can get the bone and all whatever the preference of the show ring happens to be later. So don't be intimidated by creating your own show dog. Don't you don't necessarily have to buy into it. Uh, Donna Whitaker said, I have a old English bulldog who carried her first litter, second litter, absorbed entire litter, a four, third time didn't take, all done by AI, last two progesterone tested, different stud, first time, second, third time, 
same stud. So yeah, so you you had a variation uh, with that one. Let me read that again. Lily B, who carried her first litter, second carried her first litter, second litter absorbed the entire litter. Man, a four. Third time didn't take. All is done by AI. Last two progesterone tested. Uh, different stud. First time, second, and third time, same stud. Okay, I got you. Uh, um, yeah, it, it's true. We're getting into the AIs and all that stuff. Um, I would say, Donna, best thing to do is kind of chart it so that you can always go back to the last, you know, okay, around when, when was she having her, her starting her heat? When did I breed her that it worked? Start keeping track of that on a chart, uh, on a calendar, and then save those pages uh, to that calendar as you go into each year. And I saw it free, so yeah. So just to say that again, start keeping track of it on a calendar and then save those pages so that you kind of get a rough idea of when your dog goes into heat and when's the best time to do, you know, the breedings and things like that. Still going to be a rough estimate, but at least you'll have something to look at. Uh, stud clear health tested, looking for ideas of what? Right, what do you mean? Uh, what for? And just like clockwork, hour and 20 minutes, it kicks me out. So, um, far as fertility tests you just want to get your progesterone test done with your vet as your vet because i know there's two types of different machines that they sometimes use and they might vary from each other so just ask your your vet you know which uh which one to use as far as health testing i know embark does health testing there's a few others out there uh so it's just kind of up to you um but as far as fertility and uh, as far as when to breed, as far as her, whether, you know, um, the fertility of the female, I, I'm assuming you're saying when to breed her based off of when she goes into heat. Uh, Ace 900 said, I seen a post on Facebook asking about tight cat feet, like on a string pockets in Excel, and would it be possible? My question is, where did the wide feet come from? Tight cat feet means that they don't want splayed toes. You'll see a lot of Excel where their toes kind of splay apart um the cat feet are tight if you look at uh pictures of king of diamonds when it our dog when it shows his feet his feet are they're, they're like boxing gloves they're they're tight and that's what you want so that the dog when it runs over surfaces it doesn't have to worry about things getting cut or in between its toes as much um but yeah so when they say cat feet it just means that the feet are rounded and the toes are you know together Together. and um you know almost like a like a, a, a small boxing glove and uh when you start to get weak pasterns not taking care of the nails uh the, especially when their puffs the feet start to grow start to spread also depending on the surface you have them on as pups um and also genetics plays a part in to splay toes also let's see here not sure what that is um mr js for answering my question about co ah no problem brother uh brian happy new year's what's up man thanks for joining in all right so last topic then we'll get back into the comments the bully the breeding game the bully game and the social media game which one are you playing uh when i added that to the topics i got hit in my inbox and by two people they had a problem with me using the word game um you know dog breeding shouldn't be considered a game blah 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 i get all that i'm black and we use the term game regardless of what it is um the finance game the real estate game the breeding game the bully game that is just a word and that typically is used in replacement of competition or business. So that's why I called it that. As far as the breeding game, what is the breeding game? It's about breeding. 
if you are 100% focused on it, then you are trying to take two dogs and make better and better dogs based off the litter, not one dog. Um, in every breeding, you want it to get better and better. The bully game. What is the bully game? The bully game is uh, this partial breeding game, but you want to be at the top of the pyramid scheme of bully breeding and get as many people under you buying dogs from you as possible. And your biggest tool for that is what? The social media game. Getting yourself out there, promoting your dogs, uh, you know, and unfortunately, American bully, people are less into the breeding game and more into the bully game and the social media game. And this is why we have so many breeders who have been breeding these dogs 10, 15 years and they still got high rears, lack of angulation, weak pasterns. Um, they're still breeding out to other yards rather than developing their own yard. They got a bunch of dogs that they consider the development of their own yard. But if you've got all these dogs, why are you constantly having to breed out? You should have been creating several dope males and several dope females that you should be by now. But you got people who've been breeding this breed 10, 15 years, and they don't have a bloodline. They're not close to having a bloodline. Um, they're still outsourcing to the popular stud. Uh, or taking their popular stud to another female, um, doing pup back deals, co-owns, things like that. Um, but what it's all said and done is to build their portion, their pyramid within the overall bully pyramid scheme. And this is a pyramid scheme breed, unfortunately. Um, and like I said, and that's why you see breeders who have been breeding this breed for so long, but yet know nothing about dogs. And, uh, you know, they're making good money, but their dogs aren't any better than half the new breeders. You know, one of the gimmicks that they'll say in the bully pyramid game is, uh, you know, new breeders don't listen. What they're, because a lot of the older breeders don't have anything worth listening to, uh, especially if you know dogs. Um, you know, and it, it's just a lot of gimmicks. They'll say they breed for temperament, but they can't. I tell you what, what drive they breed for. I breed for sure allow flaws that most major registries wouldn't allow. So if you're just limiting yourself to the bully show ring, then are you really, you know, breeding for that? On the live we did yesterday with uh, myself, uh, Raul, Danny, uh, Bobby, and uh, they had uh, Fred on there yesterday, you know, we should all be trying, you know, Dooley's a great looking dog. Prince Charmer's a great looking dog. Um, Vibes Cartel is a great looking dog. You know, we should all be breeding towards that look, even though all three of those dogs look totally look different. We should all be kind of breeding towards that look with our own spin on it. You know, you want to breed for breed type. And what a lot of breeders who sit at the top of the pyramid scheme will tell you is no you don't breathe for your vision you breathe to the written standard okay well that's never been said in the history of dogs you breathe for breed type if you want to win in the show ring then you breathe for the written standard that that's how dogs are done um because if i breed my dog for performance it may not be the preferred look of this year's show ring so um when it comes to the bully game that's something that you have to be careful of who your mentors are there's no one person that anybody should be listening to and uh you know you there you've got to also look in even when you hear me say things on these lives look into it ask other breeders google it um get books on it you know uh verify it to make so that you can hear it in different ways to make it make sense um but don't just believe one person in this th whole thing. Don't disbelieve one person in this whole thing. Um, there's a lot of games being played. And unfortunately for these dogs, the bully game is an extreme hustle um, that is used by a lot of people who are just in it because they like dogs, but they love money and they want to make a quick buck off these dogs. So that's the bully game. As far as the social media game, it's social. 
Um, that's the key word to it. Media is whatever content we put forth with our posts, our comments, things like that. Um, as you get more and more popular, you are going to come across people who troll you, who hate you. What I would advise with people is give everybody respect. That's the one thing I try to do. I don't let nobody take me off my tier. Um, if somebody's annoying or a distraction, most people know that the reason I go live is to educate the community, not because I wanted to go live, but because it's something that I see the community needs, just an overall better understanding of dogs. If I notice somebody's a distraction to what I do, I'll go ahead and I just unfriend them. If I unfriend you, but you're still popping up on my stuff, and um, you know, some people will get on my nerves, but it is what it is. People who are disrespectful, people who I know wasn't on my best behavior in social media and were to see them in real life, I know I do something to them. Those are the people you want to block. Just block them. That way you don't have to deal with them. They can't see none of your posts. They'll still hear about you and they'll still make posts and things like that about you. But you want anybody that takes you off of you being the best in social media, you want to block you want to block those people because you don't want them having no they if they've got no boundaries and they're disrespectful you don't want that to cause you to have no boundaries and you to be disrespectful and then somebody's watching and they're turned off by you and what it is you have to offer whether it's knowledge whether it's pups whatever it may be so when it comes to this whole thing don't let social media take you off of your game one of the best things I've ever heard since being on social media. And I was off social media for, for about five years. Not intentionally, it just kind of kind of happened that way. And when my cousin hit me up about breeding American bullies, everything kind of gravitated towards Facebook. And so I jumped back in on social media. Um, one of the best things I heard was an exotic breeder. And he said, when it comes to you know, these bullies and social media, uh, they will either, how did he say it? They will either bring out your true character or they will take you out of character. So you want to, uh, uh, you want to be disciplined about yourself and don't let idiots take you, you know, from being the best you. you. Somebody's overly has no boundaries, they're disrespectful. They're doing that on there because they're on computer. I've had people threaten me, say all kinds of stuff. I'm not a big dude, but ain't nobody talking to me like that in person. It's just not going to happen. Um, and that's how you, because most of these people when, that talk to you, I can say everybody's talked to me crazy, made threats or whatever. I spotted that they were cowards long beforehand. I've been told I better not show up to shows, show up to the show by myself or we're just with my son. And, um, you know, you get a couple people that eyeball you, they might be the one that was making that comment. But, um, you know, it is what it is. Most of these people ain't gonna do nothing. They're just running their mouths, trying to keep whatever image they, they're they out there. Most of these people started off trying to be cool and ended up, turned out they weren't, they're idiots. And now they're comfortable with that on social media. And as long as they can be an idiot, and still sell dogs, bring attention to themselves. Have, hit laughing emojis and all those kind of things for their own entertainment. Just don't let it take you out of care because you're in this for the long, if you miss happens today with some idiot on social media, don't let that take you away from who you plan on being on social media, breeding these dogs in 10 years. Don't let today do that. So when you bring it all together, the breeding game, the bully game, the social media game, um, when it comes to the breeding, Learn as much as possible. Take it seriously. You should be breeding for three things. The look or confirmation of the dog. The, the temperament of the dog. The ability of the dog. Start with temperament and ability. Then you start getting and the looks. Because if you start with those two, use as far as confirmation and, and looks. And then you get specifically into looks. Um, and when I say ability, it can be the way the dog plays fetch the willingness to guard, protect, um, whatever it is you you want to do, some type of physical, and men, something that's mental and physical uh, that is it comes from action. Um, 
as far as the bully game, study the written standard, understand it. Whatever it is you disagree with, then that's where and get a, or start looking at dogs. You know which ones. Uh, um, Truly fit what the look of the breed, the focus on, uh, but still understand the written standard. Look at those show dogs. This is what the average one person wants. What do the grand champions look like in UKC, ABKC? And then what is it that you're looking for in the look of the of the breed type of these dogs? And then as far as social media, get out there, have fun with it, ask questions, join groups, post your dogs. Don't let idiots cause you to be an idiot like my mom always says when two people are arguing one person might be a fool but people watching from the distance don't know who's a fool or not so, so avoid getting caught up if it's a friendly debate that's cool when you see things getting personal back away from it let that person be an idiot on their own move on they might be just stepped on their toes they try to troll you for a while they'll go away. Trolls can't operate for forever. They have to move on to something else because they get bored quick. So that would be my advice as far as that. And let's go ahead and go with the comments and finish up this live. Happy holidays. Back to you, House of Blue Pit Bulls. Uh, let's see. Donna said, your lives aren't long enough. I could listen to you all day. I love you so much. Thank you for taking the time to teach us, like, and share everyone. Yes, and thank you, Donna. Thank you. I appreciate you guys joining in. Brian, crates are actually a safe place for the dogs. That's all it is. That's exactly what it is. That's the best way to put it. People look at it, oh, you're just locked in a crate. Get the dog the proper amount of exercise, the proper amount of socialization, bonding with you. But a crate is a great place to put your dog when you go to work, when you go to sleep, when you go to the liquor store, whatever it may be. But you still want to remember to take your dog out places, get it out places as much as possible. Um, you going to the gym tonight? Oh, tomorrow morning. I thought you were going tonight. Um, Naheem said, what do you prefer? Ooh, good looking out. A female bully or male bully and why? I prefer a female, but um, a do, I do like both. Um, I, you know what? I'm partial to male dogs outside of my home. I'm partial to female dogs inside my home. So when I step outside my fence and the leash is on or I'm going somewhere, the dog's in the car, I like my male dog's attitude. When I'm at home, I like females more because they tend to be more naturally protective of their surroundings. Um, they chill a little more. Male dog kind of wants to get into things all the time. And Sadie is a contradiction. Of, Cardi Bull is a contradiction of everything I just said because she operates like a male dog in the house constantly wanting to get into stuff but um yeah i'm I, you know I, i'm kind of both i prefer when i'm in public i like my male dogs and when i'm out away from home and then when i'm at home that's when i prefer my female dogs uh brian said three weeks later my embark kit finally made it back to the lab from canada patiently waiting the results now okay there you go uh let, let us know how it goes uh uh, I that knowledge thrower. What's up, man? Thanks for joining in. Uh, throw out the fire emojis. Um, hour and 20 minutes, exactly. Brent, <laughs> for some reason, every hour and 20 minutes, it throws me off. I don't know what that's about. Uh, John, thanks for the knowledge. Thank you for joining. Uh, Ross said, Question Why isn't it smart to breed a XL bully to American pit bull terrier? I would think if it the stub books are open, so it's not like you can't. I wouldn't say it's not a smart thing. Um, chances are Pitbull has the confirmation that you're looking for. Definitely a healthier dog um, than the average bully. So I would say breeding your XL American bully to a Pitbull isn't a problem. You just want to make sure that that Pitbull is not, because these dogs aren't supposed to be overly dog aggressive, and they're not supposed to be human aggressive at all, you know, unless they're protecting their home or their owner uh, or their family. So I would say is if it's a well-balanced mannered pit bull, then I don't see a problem with it. Uh, just make sure that you're honest about that. Uh, and you would have to end up single registering the dog. Brandon said, any recommendations for owners with hardwood floors? Um, any rug or mat that work best? 
I would say definitely get your throw rugs. I don't know. I would need my wife to say it, but the type that are thick with the tight stitching um, is best. Uh, try to get as many of them as possible, especially in the places that the dog happens to be a lot. Uh, um, you know, it's just better, especially when the dog is developing uh, as pups, um, you know, because sometimes those hardwood floors cause them to slip a lot. Uh, it can mess up their hips. It can all also cause their toes to spread out so i would say the places that the dog frequents try to have as many throw rugs or large you know rugs as possible and you want to get that 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 uh i'm putting my fingers up but you want to get that tight stitch you know the thick with tight stitching i don't know how to say it and my wife's not here right now so i can't ask her um but i think you know what i mean rashad said facts i felt loud game time uh what's up Rhodes? thanks for joining in brother uh Gitman, oh G Hitman, what's up, dude? How do I deal with a dog that is house trained but will piss inside if I take another dog out without him? Do I just crate and that's it? Or is there a way to stop that behavior? What I would do is yes. Yes, use the crate. So what you're basically saying is you have the dog in the house, it's doing perfectly fine. Then you take another dog out, you bring that dog back in, and now you've seen where this dog has pissed in the house. And all that is is a buildup of anxiety. You took one dog out, it wants to be out, so it ends up peeing. What I would do is put the dog in the crate. Put the dog in the crate, then take the dog out, and that dog will learn to not pee in the crate and eventually get over the anxiety that's causing that. So how would I break that down? Um, if you put the dog in the crate and it urinates in the crate, which no dog wants, and I might be freezing again. There we go. So it's going to have to urinate in the crate, which no dog wants. You come back, crate, leave him in there for a minute with it. You know what I'm saying? Um, let the dog out to clean it or clean it while the dog is still in there. Leave the dog in there. Bring it back out. Keep doing that every time every time you do that put the dog in the crate eventually the dog's going to not pee in the crate because it knows it might get left in there with the pee for 5 10 15 20 minutes once that dog learns to hold it it will then learn to hold it when that other dog goes out and then that's when you'll start practicing on the dog doing it without being in the crate so eventually i would say for maybe a week or two Every time you take that dog out, put the dog that pisses in a crate. When it gets to the point that it doesn't piss in the crate, and the longer it goes, the more, and when you start noticing it's pissed in the crate, let it stay being there five minutes. Does it again, let it be. If it's still doing it, now let it be in there 10 minutes. Next week, it's still doing it, now let it be in there 15 minutes. You just keep on going. You never back down. Just keep on going. Eventually, the dog will learn to stop pissing in the crate. Then you're going to, once it learns that, it goes a whole week without pissing in the crate when you let the other dog out. Then go ahead, let it out, and take that other dog out. If it pisses on the floor again, then we're over again. And then it, and eventually, it'll put two and two together. That not only is this about me not wanting to be around the urine every time he goes outside, and then also make sure that you take that dog out immediately. You know, when it, when it, so that it, it starts to learn also that when that dog goes out, it means I'm getting ready to go out. I just need to be calm and patient. So hopefully that makes sense. If it didn't, definitely hit me up on Messenger and uh, we can go more into it. Gloria Murphy said, Void FYI, I don't know what these little things are. Uh, uh, Dom Seguins, I got a super lazy dog to actually, there we go. I got a super lazy dog to actually want to do stuff now because of the knowledge. He's actually wanting to take the toy from me now. Thank you. Ah, I'm glad that worked out because I remember you asking about that. So I'm glad you were able to get that worked out with him. That's good. Um, especially because it sucks when you got a dog that don't want to do things, but you want to do them. Uh, Robert, how do I stop my exotic from beating up X? <laughs> Y'all ignore Robert McCormick. He thinks his exotics can beat up XLs and outrun them. Um, so, y'all, ignore Robert. Uh, matter of fact, when Robert shows up, just 
do like this when you see his name or put, keep keep him keep him back uh let's see uh marie said how much should a person expect to pay for a first or second pick female in general first or second pick i got cardi bull was second pick it's all over the place cardi bull was second pick she was three thousand um king of diamonds i think was fifth pick he was four thousand uh lady justice i think was a fourth or fifth pick she was four or five thousand it just varies on the breed most people uh due to that is one they would have been keeping um so yeah it, it just depends on the breeder um you know it, it's gonna vary you know is it a show dog is it is it or is the breeder into showing is he not um there's really no way to say it i would say the average bully runs anywhere from three to six thousand dollars um so you're going to be looking in between there eric said if a new breeder bought an established dog like dooley or he-man from their well-known owners with the value of what the dog offered under the prior owner be diminished because a new guy isn't as known definitely this is a breed that is a lot about um who owns the dog luckily when it comes to fred and danny they're not like huge marketers uh to where they built you know this huge brand um so you could probably get he-man um and sell them for close to the same price or duly and sell them for close to the same price as Fred or Danny. Um, but the average breeder that has a name for themselves, if you take over that dog, you're not going to be able to sell it for the, the same amount. Uh, he's actually peed in the crate, but just once. And it's been like a year and a half. Um, maybe in the crate just once. It's been like a year and a half. I'm going, okay. Yeah, try what I said, and it should it should work. Uh, let's see. Rob said my eyes can work more than a lot of bullies, bro. Don't. <laughs> Unfortunately, there is some truth to that because you got one of the only exotics you'll see running on treadmills and shit. So, unfortunately, there is some truth to that. Albert said hello. Good evening. What do you think about purchasing puppies at an older age, four plus months? Let's say that you get a better understanding of what you're buying over a younger pup. Um, Cardi Bull was from Romania, so I couldn't get her. They won't ship a dog under four months. Once she hit four months, they shipped her out. Um, I think it's cool. Uh, Younger you get the pup, the more you are able to. Uh, the younger you get the pup, the more you're able to kind of imprint yourself, your vibe, how your house operates onto it. Um, but four months is, is is not bad. You know, you should be able to work with any um, old any four month old dog. I keep seeing myself freezing on the computer, uh, so I'm not sure if it's doing that with you guys. Um, But yeah, four months is not bad. I don't have a problem with four. There is a, there's a dog I'm picking up next year. Uh, when we moved to Arkansas, and that dog is a year old now, so it'll be about a year and a half when I get it. Um, you know, I'm doing that because I'm experienced with dogs, so I wouldn't advise everybody to do that. But I would definitely, say, and I trust the the breeder. But I, I would say four months, you know, anybody should be able to take a four month old pup and um, acclimate it to their home and their environment. Uh, Derek Wilson said, what's wrong with a 26 inch lean tone bully? Get so much flack for uh, being tall. What if, if they're well proportioned athletic? Um, the bully breed is about head mass and bone so if the dog is athletic i think that that's great but you're going to get flat yeah uh, um 
you know, you're you're because everybody's looking for those, especially as the breeze starts to get more extreme. I would say, in my opinion, if that's what you like, continue with it because there are a lot of people who do prefer that. And if you get off of Facebook and out into the streets, the masses tend to prefer um, that style dog. So I would say if that's what you like, um, then run with it, you know. Just be ready to breed more mass and more bone into, you know, your program. Go ahead and get those dogs that can bring, bring that in. Yes, Dooley is a dope dog. So it looks like that's the last comment. Uh, we've been on here for, what, almost two hours? Uh, let me see. I'll stall for a little bit just in case anybody has any other questions. But, yeah, you got to breed what you, you like. Just remember to respect the breed type of the breed, which bone, muscle, uh, head. So if you've got a dog that's athletic and you like it tall, you like it lean, go ahead and, and you know, find another female that compliments him but brings a little bit of, of girth and bone to it. Um, and, you know, compromise a little bit, but don't go towards something that's less healthy than what it is you're used to. Uh, so, you know, again, it, it, it's up to you. It's still an American bully, regardless of the trash that people talk. Um, but, you know, and when you get off Facebook, you'll be able to build your own clientele as you take your dogs on walks and, you know, get you some business cards ready to go and things like that. I see you. I'm coming in a little bit. I see you. I'm coming. Um, so if that's it, we're going to go ahead and get off. Floyd is about to start calling my name right now and because uh, he's hungry. And uh, that ends it. We'll be back next Tuesday, same time, same place. Thank you all for joining in.